call to worship will be taken from Psalm 25. If you have your Bible and you want to follow along, Psalm 25, otherwise I'll read it. Verses 1 to 5. The word of the Lord. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. I'll keep reading two verses. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, indeed, we do thank you for your great love, your steadfast love, your mercy, your kindness. We praise you as the psalmist wrote that you do not remember uh, the sins of our youth, you remember our desire to know you and love you and walk with you. So we give you praise and thank you. And I do pray, Lord, for everyone who is here this morning that you might bless, you might encourage them, that we might hear your voice speaking to us uh, in our worship this morning. So we give you praise, we give you thanks. You are our good God, and we love you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. to shine on me and that my soul knows very well you lift me up 
I'm cleansed and free, and that my soul knows very well. You make your face to shine on me, and that my soul knows very well. You lift me up, I'm cleansed and free, and that my soul knows very well. When mountains fall, I'll stand by the power of your hand, and in your heart of hearts I'll dwell, and that my soul knows very well. When mountains fall, I'll stand. Each day I'll find, and then my soul knows very well. Forgiveness, hope, I know is mine, then my soul knows very well. When mountains fall, I'll stand by the power of your hand. In your heart of hearts, I'll dwell, and then my soul. going to do a responsive reading as our community prayer. So I'm going to read and then your line is, how long, O Lord, how long? So this is a responsive reading back and forth, a prayer, and we're thinking of God's call for us and our response for him, all right? So your repetitive line will be, how long, O Lord, how long? O God, we remain divided from one another not only in matters of faith, order, and tradition, but also by pride of nation, class, and sex. Our reading, how long, O Lord, how long? O God, in parishes and congregations, we remain strangers. How long, O Lord, how long? O God, we are to announce your gospel in the world, yet we too often remain odd by that world, fearful of it, conform to it, and so the preaching cannot be heard. How long, O Lord, how long? O God, we who are rich have failed in imagination to do what needs to be done for the poor. We who are poor have failed to liberate the rich from their perilous imprisonment. How long, O Lord, how long? O oh God, we have built a broken, disordered, exploited, and tired world. You designed a different world. Forgive our mistakes and restore our hope. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Lord, light of the world, you have begun to show us more and more brilliantly the many splendors of the world. We discover not only other churches, but other peoples, other cultures, other hopes, other political systems, other tongues. Let us see and rejoice. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Lord, light of the world, you choose, to us, you choose us to drive out darkness and take part in the mission of God. Let us not forget that each one of us is sent to our own community, to every nation, and to all people. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Lord, light of the world, you have called many of us together into a fellowship which continues to grow. Let us celebrate that growing community. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Lord, light of the world, 
You chose to show your coming splendor in transfigured glory. Now let us celebrate our expectation and our present knowledge in splendid worship. Even so, come Lord Jesus. God our Father, you can make all things new. We commit ourselves to you. Help us to live for others, since your love includes all men and women, to seek those truths which we have not yet seen, to obey your commands which we have not heard but not yet obeyed, to trust each other in the fellowship which you have given us. And may we be renewed by your spirit through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture is taken, or today's scripture reading is taken from Romans 14, 1 to 12. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another, another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord. For they give thanks to God, and whoever abstains does so to the Lord and give thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You, then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely I, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Romans 14, 1 to 12. Before I went away um, for the month of August, we were looking at Romans, and we were thinking of post-Pentecost um, instructions for us. And so this is the last of, uh, of that set. Um, having received Christ, having received his Holy Spirit, that's the celebration of Pentecost, the painting we have in the baptistry if you're visiting with us. Yeah, Mark's Pentecost, the idea of the flame, the flame of God, the flame of the Spirit coming upon us. And what difference does that make for us in our world and in our communities of faith? And of course, one of the differences that that should make is that we are united together uh, in Jesus. If this whole thing is real at all, and we believe it is, then brothers and sisters in the faith, we should be able to um, go forward in a spirit of solidarity and unity. Hence the reading that we did earlier was a litany uh, for the unity of the church. So there have always been challenges, right? There have been challenges in the first century. There's challenges now, 2,000 years later. And we'll look at some of those. Paul addresses some of those in, in this unit, right? So that's, that's our experience. How do we hang in there together when we have different views and different perspectives, right? So that's, that's where Paul's going here. 
And of course, in his day, a big difference was the coming together of the Jewish community and the Gentile community as the new church of God, the church of God, the church of Christ. And that was a huge change. You can imagine the Jewish community, they had their commitment to the Torah and their laws for thousands of years. And then all of a sudden, this new group of everyone else comes into the fold. And there are lots of varieties, lots of stuff going on. So how does the church, how does those groups come in together? That was a big part in the story of Acts. I don't know if you, get to saw, if you saw a small light. Did any of you watch that small light? I mentioned it. Oh, a couple of months ago, a small light, a series, and it's a series on the person who was in charge of taking care of the Anne Frank family uh, during the Second World War, and uh, her name was Meep, and she protected, uh, the, as best she could, the Frank family for two years in the city of Amsterdam when it was under Nazi control. It's a true story. And she would go about trying to find food and so on uh, to meet this large family. There was at least 10 or 12 of them because the others started joining them as well. And they had to maintain secrecy so the Nazi regime wouldn't find out about them and so on. And they, she managed to do that for two long years. Challenge because the family were, were obviously were Jewish. They were in hiding, and they had all of their, you know, their guidelines and their rules for living and which foods they could eat and so on. And it was a real challenge. But uh, Meep did the best that she could to to address their needs and find out what she could do. And she would even scour the the city for fresh fruit. I remember my mom telling me growing up in. Dublin, that uh, Christmas time for them, the big thing was to get an orange. They each got an orange. It's a true story. And that orange was special for them. They had 10 kids. There weren't a whole lot of presents going around. But if they got their orange, that made them feel good. And apparently at meals, for example, generally in my mother's family, my, her dad worked hard to support this family in this tiny little house in Dublin. I've seen that little house. He would be working hard all day. When he came home, he would be the one who would eat the meat. He would eat the meat, and the mom wouldn't let anybody else eat the meat until he finished. And then whatever else was left of the meat, then the other kids got to eat 10. So that sounds like a different day, doesn't it? I haven't told you guys that story, but that's a true story. Different days, right? Different experiences. So the church and their experiences 2,000 years ago, and here we are with our own uh, realities today. So that's kind of the idea. That's the backdrop for uh, this text in Romans 14, living and belonging to the Lord. There's a wonderful little jewel in the middle of this, verses 7 to 9, that I want us to see and note, because it's, it's a great text that reminds us of God's goodness. So we're calling this living and belonging to the Lord. So if you're visiting with us today, and this is the first time you're here, you know, like this might seem like a little strange text to jump in on, but, but we hope that, uh, you know, something is there that might feed your souls. So Paul lays down four principles here that should govern the church in the city of Rome 2,000 years ago and should govern us today. The first principle is, we welcome the other, whoever the other is, because God has welcomed them. We see the verse. He's starting here with eating issues, because that was a big deal in the first century, Jewish and Greek communities. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. So we go back, we... I'm going to go back there. Let's see what I got. Oh, one more. There we go. Got this. We welcome the other because God has welcomed them. So who is the other? Who is the other for us? Welcome the other. Well, one of the big stories that, we, of course, we see in Canada right now is the immigrant, right? The refugee. 
people who come and have a hard time settling in or we don't help them that much, we help them a little bit and then don't follow through and help them the way we should help them. Just a story that a whole bunch of folk from, I believe it was Ghana, ended up in a church in Toronto in the north, 250 people. They were living on the street. They were brought over here, and then they had nowhere to go. Shelters didn't have enough room, so the church opened their doors, and they, for a couple of months now, have taken care of these families. That would just be like us. Imagine 250 people coming here, living downstairs in the gym. And then that church trying to do the best they can to help provide their needs. Well, they've done their best, but right now they can't do it any longer because all these other programs are starting up and so on. So what's going to happen to those folk at this point in time? Welcome the others. So that's a real story happening in the city of Toronto. But all around the country, all around North America, all around the world, Climate change, people are having to change, having to move countries, are, people are migrating, moving around. The church is called to welcome the other because God has welcomed them. Welcome the other because God has welcomed them. Folk who come here to our community, Weston, we are to do our best to welcome them. Why? Principle number one, God has welcomed them. Two, those who eat must not despise those who abstain. Well, we got that one. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Welcome the other because Christ died and rose for them. That's the second principle. God has worked in Christ for us all. And so that should be something that binds us, that encourages us. Listen to this text. We do not live to ourselves. And we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. That happens because Christ died and rose for us. So the second principle is Jesus has done his work for us all. And because of that then, our brothers and sisters, we'll see, are covered by what Christ has done. So God has welcomed the number one, and then secondly, Jesus died and rose for us all. No distinction. Jesus has done that for us all, for God so loved the world. Of course, we must respond with what's our response to that. But God's work is for everybody, every person on the planet. Worked Jesus' work for them, for us. So when we realize that, you see, that changes how we should be viewing one another. Because our Savior, God in Christ, is the same for you and for me in his compassion and love for us. Third principle, he or she is our brother or sister. So the folk here, right? I don't know. You've probably got some people here in our church who've been around long enough that kind of bug you a little bit, that irritate you. I don't know. Darlene, what about you? I won't pick on you. You love everybody, okay. Yeah, Marjorie, I know you love everybody. <laughs> Eleanor, I don't know about Eleanor. <laughs> Anybody loves everybody, it's Eleanor. Well, we are to love because we are brothers and sisters, right? We are, that's, that's who we are, brothers and sisters together. It's easy to forget that when we're uptight with one another, when we're irritated and wish that they go away, right? But that's not what Paul says. So it's the third principle. And why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister, or you? Why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Just interesting on that translation there, the judgment seat of God. The Greek doesn't really say that. What it says is that we will, be, we will give an accounting of ourselves. How does that happen, eh? Eight billion people on the planet and all the people who have come before us. God's a slow God. God's a patient God. We're told that everybody, you're going to have your moment. <laughs> I'm going to have my moment. Where we will sit down and we'll just have a little session. 
We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. That, that, that doesn't mean in terms of our faith whether you're in or you're out. It's not, that's not the point. The point is you have been given a precious gift and it's your life. And God wants to know what you did with your life. He's given you all the talents, right? Some person has one talent, meaning a gift, spiritual gift, others five, other ten, you know the parable. What have you done with the gift that I gave you? That's what that text is about. So we all stand before that unit, that, that reality. And so what that partly means, though, is that you know, you and I don't have to take on the role of judge. We don't have to decide on who's in, who's out. That's not our job. God's job is that. God's job is to see and hear the accountability of each one. We don't know each other completely, right? We reveal what we want to reveal. You know what I've told you about. What I haven't told you about, you don't know. Same with all of us. So we don't know the whole story. People are very complex, are they not? You are complex. You have your own long story. And it's had a lot of ups and downs. That is your reality, and it's my reality. The longer you live, the longer it is, up and down, up and down, up and down. So we don't know each other completely. So what's our call then? Our call is to be compassionate, to be merciful, to be loving, because we don't know it all, and we can leave it in God's hands who does. Paul is making that point. He's the one. So we trust and depend on him. We can, take, we can rest in that. See what I mean? We can rest in that because God will sort it all out eventually. We can't possibly know the whole thing. What's going on in Russia and Ukraine right now? These are, these are essentially brothers and sisters, right? There's not much difference between the Russian community and the Ukrainian community. If you go back and see their births, where they've come from as nations, but we have brothers and sisters who are killing each other. We don't know their story. Don't know their story. We don't even know a bad guy, let's say, Putin's story. You don't know his story. I don't know his story. Zelensky. I don't know his story. But they're acting out, both sides, violence. I mean, there can be causes for all this, reasons why you might fight, right? I'm not saying there can't be, but we don't know the stories. We don't know these individuals. They all have people who love them, care for them. They've all had moms, they've all had dads, they all have brothers and sisters. But there's this acting out. So finally, God is the one. God is the one who we trust and depend and lean on in his mercy, in his steadfast love that we've read in, about in Psalm 25. His mercy, his kindness, his beauty. We rest in that. So those are the four principles that Paul begins with. It's interesting that he takes the time to lay those out. God welcomes us. Christ has died for everybody. We are looking at each other as brothers and sisters in the faith. And finally, God has his time of accounting for each one of us. That's just the reality for Paul as he lays out this story. That's the construct. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Notice at the end. So then each of us will be accountable to God. I think when I was small, was I younger, if I had read that, I would have been pretty afraid. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Oops. I feel I'm tight. But the reality is, is God is a God of love and mercy, compassion. And if anybody is compassionate for you, it's God. That's the beauty. 
And so I can go and ultimately trust that God understands me at a fundamental level and that that will be a good thing. And it will be the same for you. So examples from Paul. Well, you, we've read it. Food eating disputes. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. There were these eating disputes. You remember the story. You remember the story that Peter, who was a good Jew, um, was eating with the, the Gentile community's brothers in Galatia. And then all of a sudden the Jewish community shows up and immediately Peter withdraws from them and eats with the Jewish people because the other Jewish people were not understanding how you're, you're eating with Gentiles. So he immediately drew back. So this, this is Peter, the great apostle of the faith, right? He's showing bias and prejudice in his own life at that time. He was eating with the Gentiles. He draws back when his his uncles or cousins come or something, somebody comes, and then he only eats with the Jewish people. And Paul, who is also a Jew and who is a Pharisee even in his tradition, comes and says to him, like, what are you doing, Peter? You can't do that. This is fundamentally divisive. We cannot do that. We are now together. We eat together. This is the new community of faith. You don't think that would be hard for Peter? Probably would have been very hard for Paul too. But they had to get over it, and they did eventually. <sighs> Peter has another time, right? There's an individual who's Greek, who's a, who's a Gentile. His name is Cornelius. You know these stories. Cornelius has a dream. And the dream is, um, you know, God is working in his life. And the story goes on with Cornelius. And, and Peter has another dream, who, who is to be welcomed. And he finally goes to Cornelius' house, and then the, the goal is that Peter will accept Cornelius, recognize his brother. Am I getting that story right? No? Tell me whether that's right, Beth. I'm flying by the seat of my pants here, so just tell me. Peter has a dream. Okay, that's what I was going with that, eating unclean animals. And I'm doing fine. All right, yeah. <laughs> it's the same story. It's Peter and Cornelius. But anyway, the point is, is Peter won't accept Cornelius until the Lord says, don't call what something is clean unclean. Don't make that distinction. So Peter had a hard time getting over this. But that's the call. So there's these disputes over eating, Okay. Secondly, there are disputes over days, special days. What do we do on the Sabbath? Gentiles weren't Jews, so they didn't have the Torah tradition, the Sabbath tradition. And so the Jewish community worshipped on Saturday, the Sabbath. Christians started worshipping on Sunday, the first day of the week, in recognition of Christ's resurrection. So you see what I mean? That may not seem like a big deal to us, but it was a big deal in the day. And Paul is saying, okay, let people be strong in their faith, confirmed in what they want to do, but don't judge them if it's different than you. I've had lots of students who are Seventh-day Adventists, and they're believers, strong believers, and they worship on Saturday. And sometimes they, they don't really understand why we worship on Sunday and not Saturday. And then I have other people who are Christians who are wondering why they worship on Saturday and not Sunday. So they're not issues that are completely absent in our own culture. What do we do on special days? What do you do today when you go home? How do you celebrate the Sabbath? We went around the whole room. There would be lots of different opinions. Paul says, okay, those are things we have to be able to work out in unity. Examples from today. Well, we've always picked up on smoking and alcohol. You know? Can kind a of Christian smoke? I mean, we know the answer is yes, a Christian can smoke. But this is, a, this is an issue. Alcohol. Do we drink? 
It was interesting. I remember years ago being at a people's church, and there was a big presentation on C.S. Lewis. And one of the main speakers in light of C.S. Lewis's life was there speaking. And the big issue for many of the people sitting there at People's Church, I was just younger at that point, was, well, Lewis smoked at that time. Did he smoke a cigar? He did, right? Smoked a cigar. Beth knows C.S. Lewis so well. In spite of all his writings that are so beautiful, the question for many was, well, how come C.S. Lewis smoked a cigar? And, and they couldn't get over that because Christians don't smoke anything, but particularly not cigars, right? I mean, you know. But that was the big stumbling block. And a big stumbling block can also be alcohol. So we have these issues, and the issue is do not judge one another. You have your practice. Be firm in your practice, but don't judge the other. That always comes back to that. Don't judge. They can do what they want on those issues. Perspectives on Sabbath keeping, the same. What do we do on Sunday? What do we not do? These are real issues. Perspectives on cultural differences, music. I remember I, my group that I had years ago, we had a drummer. And we were asked to go up and play at a camp in, around Wasaga Beach, a Christian camp. And we get up there, and then the pastor who organized it saw us unloading drums. And he says to me, Alan, your drummer can't play. And I said, what do you mean our drummer can't play? I said, you know who we are. You know our music. You know that we have drums. So why are you saying you can't have a drummer play? He wants me to just get over all this and just have him sit. But I was like only 21, and I said, he doesn't play, we don't play. So whether that was a Christian response, I don't know, but that's what I said. <laughs> Pretty soon he changed the and we all played. And you know what? The people loved good old Mark on drums. They all loved it. He managed to do it, set it up by reading the Psalms, banging on cymbals and so on, finally went over. But there were differences on music. Difference on films, all those kinds of things. You know what I mean? How do we view? What do we do? What do we say? Judging one another. Lots of other issues as well. What's our response? How do we view it all? I was out west recently, spoke at First Baptist Church in Nanaimo. And, you know, it's a different community out there, right? It's a, Nanaimo is still kind of a small town, 100,000 people, but the, the vibe is small. It's on the island, Vancouver Island. It's hard to get off. You've got to get a boat to get off, right? Once you're on the island, you know you're on an island. And so their issues are not necessarily the issues that we face. So my cousin, she listens to all my sermons, so hello, Allison, how are you? But you know what I mean? Their realities are different realities. Can men and women serve together? Can women preach? There's lots of issues, and even in Ontario here, where women still can't preach. Churches don't feel comfortable with that. You know, we've been preaching, and our, women have been preaching and or being ordained in our denomination for forever. We were one of the first groups to do it. But not all the churches necessarily agree. Darlene was telling me I wasn't at the last convention, but for the last few years, the CBOQ have been wrestling with, the, with gender issues. And you were telling me that it was extremely divisive. And half the group were saying no, and half the group were open. But it became very political and very uptight. And you weren't experiencing much of a spirit of love. 
So you see what I mean? So the, the, the divisive issues are there. So what are we to do? Well, you know, you can fall on either side of the camp here, but I mean, ultimately, we are called to live compassionately and do all we can to work together in solidarity for God and for his name in love. Where there is no love, put love, and you will find love, St. John. So wherever all that works out, show mercy, show love, show kindness, forgiveness. Leave things ultimately in God's hands because he's the one who knows it all. The great leveler in all of this is what Jesus has done for us. Jesus died and rose for all of us. Whatever the cultural differences, whatever level. Sometime here in the fall, we're going to, have, we're going to do some talks on some of these issues just so we can explore them a little bit more. Okay, I'm thinking probably the end of September, uh, beginning of October. So we're going to do that. But the great leveler here is Jesus. Jesus in your life, Jesus in my life. And the hope and the reality of that. What are our attitudes to brothers and sisters? Do not live in anxiety. Bart talks about anxious churchmen. Anxious people worry about what will happen to the church. God can take care of his church. Christ will take care of his church. We don't have to live in anxiety and fear. Not to impose our understanding on others. And I like this quote by um, Earl Palmer. The goal for the Christian is neither the status quo nor the false freedom of isolation, but get this, but rather the creative tension within solidarity. Creative tension Within solidarity, Earl Palmer writes, who was a Presbyterian preaching in Seattle. Paul calls upon each Christian to know and care about what his fellow Christians know and care about. He is calling for a way of living that is sensitive and interpersonally helpful. We won't agree on everything. <laughs> we won't. Christians around the world do not agree on everything. So can we live, as Palmer says, with creative tension within solidarity? I like that, creative tension within solidarity. And then, of course, the last piece is just Jesus consistently sides with those who are in marginalized positions. Always. Who does Jesus come to? He comes to the poor, speaks to the poor. Jesus speaks to, you know, the, the tax collectors. Jesus speaks to the prostitutes. Jesus speaks to who else? When his disciples bring the Gentiles to him, Jesus speaks to them, the Greeks. Je Jesus speaks and works with all those who are in hurting situations, who are marginalized. So, you know what, there was a, an event yesterday. How'd that go, Darlene? It was amazing. And people, maybe some of you are here today because of what happened yesterday inside, in the parking lot over here, here. I was still away, so I wasn't there. But the point is, our community is made up with a varied bunch of people, and a lot of people feel rather marginalized. On the outside. Do you ever feel like you're on the outside? You're on the outside staring in. You're not in the action. Well, Jesus comes and he sides with those who are feeling marginalized and hurting. I mean, who are Jesus' best friends? We're told that Mary and Martha and Lazarus are some of his best friends. These two sisters and a guy, her, their brother, who is rather weak and bit feeble. And Jesus comes along, and they're some of his best friends. Why Mary and Martha and Lazarus? Well, part of it is they probably were rather needy. Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus is sick. Lazarus gets sick easy. Two sisters hanging in there together. 
<laughs> These are not the strong people, right? These are not the people in the palaces. A little house in a little town. Friends of Jesus. So Jesus sides with those who are marginalized. And we are called to do that as well. And so everybody who came yesterday from all the different backgrounds, from the, their places, you know what I mean? Living in the towers of Weston, some in the community in the houses, but everybody with their stories. And so we are called to live in compassion and mercy and forgiveness and love for all of the hurting ones. So can we do that? And that's what's being expressed in this story in what seems rather funny language about disputes over eating, disputes over what to do on certain days, but that's what Paul is really doing. You can read this text, we won't go into it, but the great text in Matthew 25, what have you done for me? Have you helped those who are hungry? Have you helped those who were thirsty? Have you helped meet their needs? That's what that text is about. Coming alongside Jesus. What, what goes on in that parable? Finally, God does not say to us, well, what was your theology? What did you believe? What was your creed? He doesn't go there at all. He says, did you help those who were hurting? Those who were in need, did you, did you give them something? Did you visit people in prison? Like, this is a wake-up call for us all, right? I mean, like, are we doing those sorts of things, helping people who are hurting? Jesus says that's what God is really interested in. It doesn't matter, man, if you tick off ten things in your theology. It's how are we reacting in love, living in love, doing that. So anyway, that's the end of our post-Pentecost series on Romans. Trust that maybe there's something there for you and for me as we listen to God's voice. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you that you are a God of mercy and love, and you are a God who sides with those who are in marginalized situations. We think of all the people around the planet, not, not thinking of the 1% who have got everything. We're thinking of the other 99%. So many hurting and struggling, just trying to get by. And Lord, help us to do all we can that we might be able to help and show love to them, show love to others, people who are different from us, that we might show love to them. And as we do so, receive love back. So Lord, lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit. Continue to speak to us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as the servers come forward shortly, <coughs> we're going to celebrate the table together. And the table is a symbol of unity. It's a symbol of being united in Christ, that we eat the bread. Come on forward, guys. Drink the cup. We do so remembering Jesus, what he's done. So it's what Paul was saying in verses 7 through 9. That whether we live, whether we die, we are united in Christ. We do it all for Christ. And so each time we take the communion together, we are engaging in something that symbolizes our unity. And we have something that unites us that is much greater than anything that divides us. Jesus has done this great work. And we are to show that in love to others. So at this point, Dave is going to give thanks for the bread symbolizing Christ's body. <clears throat> Father, we thank you again as we gather. We've heard words already from Alan as he shared from your word. And one of the great things that comes to us once a month, but it can come every time we eat bread, that we give thanks to you. And the bread that we eat today we think of, as your word says, your, the body of your son, Jesus Christ, was broken for us. He gave it for us. So, Father, we pray that you would watch over us, encourage us to remember every time we eat to think of what Christ has done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we'll ask you to um, hold on to the bread and then we'll take it together. Can we do that? So we hear from the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. I'll pray for the cup. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, indeed we give you thanks. We thank you for your great love. Your love is so great that you want us to be with you for all time, eternity. That one life is not not enough. So, Lord, we give you praise and thank you. Whether it is in living or in dying, we do so in the Lord. And so, Father, we thank you for this great hope. And we know that the hope is <clears throat> founded upon Christ, your Son, and what he's done for us. So we thank you for your great love, your great sacrifice that unites us to yourself. Help us to live each day, Lord, in that love, in that reality of wanting to share your love with others because of what you've done for us. So we give you thanks now for Jesus and his shed blood for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together.
Let me read the uh, benediction for us and thank you again. And we invite you back next week. The uh, sort of next Sunday is the big kind of kickoff with the children. Uh, so we will have hopefully more families here that uh, have been away through the summer. And it'll be fun to get together. So Paul writes these words now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.